Hi folks, my name is George Myhall. This is the Office of Image Archaeology, and the place where all of these films come from uh, that are posted to this channel. Um, uh, I wanted to give you a couple of quick notes before you watch this particular um, uh, production of uh, Barbara Walters interviewing uh, Ronald and Nancy Reagan back in 1986. Uh, by the way, uh, Stick with it. It's an awesome program. Um, I, I began watching it and I couldn't stop. I had to come back later on and do all the editing that I needed to do to produce the uh, video that you're seeing now. Um, but I needed to tell you a couple things. Uh, one is, is that uh, I didn't do this by myself. Um, most of the stuff that you see come out of here, I produce myself. I don't get any help from anybody. But in this case, I had to have help because I didn't have the equipment to uh, uh, digitize this, um, this particular film. Um, you're all familiar with uh, the VHS, but not very many of you are familiar with um, something called a Sony U-Matic tape. Uh, two different animals here, and um, I didn't have the equipment to digitize this. I do this, and I, I produce some films or some videos that you see from uh, these VHS. Not many, but enough. Um, to make it worthwhile to have the equipment. These, on the other hand, um, uh, it turns out I, I recently picked up um, uh, a large box of these, I think there was like 40 of them, and I could not afford to, um, to um, have them digitized uh, anywhere in California or any place else in the nation as far as that goes, uh, because it was going to cost well over $1,000, and i not in the budget. But I was really fortunate, you were really fortunate, that. Uh, a, um, a gentleman named Scott Grammer from Hamilton County, uh, Tennessee. That's, um, uh, he lives in a little town of Red Bank near Chattanooga. And Scott um, got a hold of me through the YouTube channel and he offered to um, help digitize these films. And so we did a little bit of horse trading, but uh, in essence it didn't cost me anything other than postage to have these digitized. And uh, I just want to say thank, thank you very much, Scott. Uh, that was a huge help. And um, not only myself, but everybody watching this is going to uh, have you to thank for it. Um, there is a um, uh, links at the back of this uh, film on the, on the tail end here that uh, will take you to his YouTube channel and his website. And if you have any interest in the work that Scott does, you can see it there. I see, and um, if you need some Sony U-Matics or other items, uh, he does almost everything. Uh, magnetic tape uh, wise uh, there in uh, Chattanooga so or Red Bank rather so um, enjoy the film thank you very much for listening to me And welcome to our Academy Award Night Special. Tonight we bring you to the most prestigious motion picture theater in America, the movie theater at the White House. President and Mrs. Reagan saw 45 movies last year, including all five nominated for Best Picture. The average moviegoer sees five pictures a year, 40 fewer than the President and First Lady. Tonight we'll ask the Reagans how movies have changed since their own Hollywood careers and how they've changed since coming to the White House. We'll discuss marriage and their children, and you'll meet the Reagans as perhaps you haven't before. We'll talk with the President in the Oval Office and with Mrs. Reagan in the private quarters. And we'll be joined by some White House friends, Jimmy Stewart, Joan Rivers, Rich Little, and His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales. Stay with us. The Barbara Walters Special. Tonight, President and Mrs. Reagan. An intimate visit. The theater here at the White House and the theater at Camp David have been used more by the Reagans than by any previous administration. The president told us he likes old movies especially John Wayne films, and that of today's movies, he prefers science fiction and action adventure. Admitted movie buffs, the Reagans sometimes see two movies a week, and the president often uses movie analogies in his speeches. And good afternoon and welcome to the White House. 
In talking to a group of businessmen, he borrowed a line from Clint Eastwood. Go ahead. Make my day. And I have only one thing to say to the tax increasers. Go ahead. Make my day. <laughs> recent State of the Union, the president chose a Steven Spielberg movie to make a point. As they said in the film, Back to the Future, where are we going? We don't need roads. Who's president of the United States in 1985? Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. The actor, now the president, still refers to the film industry as the business, and he's the first to appreciate movies, television, and even comedic impressions of himself. On your mark, let's start the International Family View. 100 people surveyed, top five answers on the board. Here's the question. Name something you'd find on a farm. Yes, name something you'd find on a farm. Well. Is there a well? <laughs> Johnny Carson often does the president, and Rich Little says his Reagan impersonation is one of the most popular in his repertoire. Rich, is it hard to do Ronald Reagan? It was at the beginning, uh, because I only knew him from his movies, and the voice was a little thin, and I didn't see all the mannerisms. But after he became president, I suddenly realized, my gosh, he's great visually, I mean, with the head movement. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it's almost um, like a puppet. I, I can do him in a club, and before I even speak, I'm getting big laughs. Mr. President? Yes. What president's middle name was Rudolph? William Howard Taft. Mr. President, how do you feel when people do all of these uh, imitations of you, like Mitch Little and everything? Are they accurate? <laughs> well, I well, have to say I, I well, like <laughs> well, uh, yes, I no, I I enjoy them. I mm -hmm. them. Let me ask both of you: When you were growing up, do you remember the film that made the greatest impression on you? Well, yes, I can see it. Not an impression in the sense of something that uh, I remember the impact, and maybe it was part of the build-up and the publicity, but I remember the impact of uh, Dracula and then oh the man that's <laughs> <laughs> the one that's built by the doctor oh Frankenstein <laughs> Frankenstein what about you Mrs. Reagan anything you I can't remember, remember anyone in particular I was a movie fan too but uh, I had a big crush on Bing Crosby huge crush on Bing Crosby you did? so uh, <laughs> you know that's funny <laughs> I was going to ask you if you ever had any crushes on any of your leading ladies outside of Mrs. Reagan. Yes, tell me, honey. Mm -hmm. I thought this was the time for you to get to hear things. Did you ever before. have any crush on your leading ladies? Uh, enough on the first leading lady that I could understand. Uh, I coined a term for it, leading lady-itis, leading man-itis. I, I said for years later that maybe that was one of the problems in Hollywood, that no one should do a picture, they shouldn't do a picture together and then get married, they should wait and do another picture and see if it wasn't just leading lady-itis. June Travers was the leading lady who inspired the president's theory. The picture, love is on the air. But the president's infatuation with his co-star was more memorable than either the movie or the leading lady. I could see where where it did happen, but it uh, the picture ended, and uh, and you said bye bye. bye yeah, bye. I said bye bye. That's, that's, that's a wide. good boy. Yeah. Yes. And you, <laughs> Mrs. Reagan, I hear that you used to go out with Clark Gable. Did you? Yes. What was he like? How did you ever find that out? Hmm. <laughs> How does he compare to Ronald Reagan? Well, well, it's old some... geezer. <laughs> <laughs> He was a very, very nice, very um, unassuming, um, didn't take himself seriously at all, didn't take the business seriously at all, but... Uh, you said he was very thoughtful. He was. He was very thoughtful. Did you like him? Yes. You mean romantically? Barbara. Oh, I'm so I'm curious. sitting here next to my oh, husband. I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, maybe. Well, I mean, Clark Gable. <laughs> 
you two see a lot of films. How do you decide which films you see? Do you argue over it? Do you like the same kinds? Oh, no, we just, um, we, 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 it's usually it's two a week at Camp David, mm -hmm. Friday and Saturday nights. Yeah. Uh, I do, every once in a while, say that we ought to show a golden oldie because um, I don't think they make them like they did anymore. Because they were what? Were they more romantic, do you think? Why do you like those better than today's films? Because I say today the industry is violating one of the oldest rules of theater. They, number one, they steal the emotion of the audience uh, in, for example, the love scenes and so forth. The, you're supposed to make the audience enjoy it. And that's why kissing, for example, in the old days was very beautiful. And actually the two people doing it, you were barely touching sometimes in order to not push her face out of shape and so forth. And so you were doing it for the audience to see what in their minds they always think a kiss is. Mm -hmm. And now you just see a couple of people start chewing on each other. They <laughs> uh, but the other one that is the worst, though, the worst part is that the oldest rule of theater is that you can't do anything in the theater that is equal to the audience's imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, today they show everything and, and, and do everything. Can I tell my Ernst Lubitsch story? <laughs> Ernst Can we Lubitsch. stop him? <laughs> Ernst, no. Ernst Lubitsch. Well, Ernst Lubitsch, the great director, truly great director. And this was in the days of our production code, where we had a lot of rules about what you could and could not show. And they were voluntary rules. He had a scene that called for a wedding night. And of course, you know, everyone used to want to fudge a little on the rules of how far could they go and so forth in the hotel room. And finally, the director, Ernst Lubitsch, set the camera up in a hotel corridor focused on the door, the hotel room door. And on action, a bare feminine arm, which happened to be the arm of the stand-in, came out through the few inches, the door opened gently a few inches, and the arm came around and hung, do not disturb on the doorknob, and the door gently closed. And everyone in the audience had their own yeah. version of a wedding night. Much too explicit today, you think? Yes. Do you agree, Mr. I agree. I get embarrassed. When you do you when you say because now it's you no, know, I do. So. I get embarrassed. And the language. I just don't think they should it's unnecessary. If there's any reason for profanity or worse than profanity, the vulgar words that are used. I wonder if there are any young screen directors saying, Oh, old fashioned, oh my dear, you know. What we want is reality and you know yeah. uh, now I know they're probably out there talking about this as being prudish or something. I just think that there's no reason why the theater can't be done in good taste. When you look back, Mr. President, over your films, the good and the bad, are you on the whole happy about them or are there some that just make you wince? I have one that to this day I've never seen. <sighs> it was so terrible that I, I refused to see it. <laughs> The film the president refused to see is, ironically enough, called Code of the Secret Service, which he made under contract to Warner Brothers. Dog napper. I thought Hercules had lost himself again. You ought to be arrested. Well, that makes it unanimous. That was in the days of the double features, so you found yourself playing in what were called the Bs. Now, the B pictures, there was a whole unit for making those. So uh, you play leading roles in those and then small parts in... Uh, in A pictures until some place along the line why the audience discovered you. In my case, it was playing the Gipper. You're going to be all right, kid. I haven't got a complaint in the world, Rock. I'm not afraid. The role that changed Ronald Reagan's career was playing George Gipp, Notre Dame football hero, in the Newt Rockney story. Someday when the team's up against it, the brakes are beating the boys. Ask them to go in there with all they've got. Win just one for the Kipper. When we were looking at the list of films that you'd seen the last year or so, and some of them were the, the golden oldies, but we also saw that uh, in 1985, the two of you watched Hellcats of the Navy, in which you starred <laughs> together. Well, we thought that was very sweet. We went, did, you, did you do it every year? Is it every, <laughs> well, no, every three months you say, no, we'll watch Hellcats. No, but when we see the picture, we always invite the people that have to come up to Camp David with us to come in, and they're always with us to see the pictures. And every once in a while, there's some talk about it, and so uh, we just decided that we'd just have to show them that uh, 
Uh, we really had been in the business. <laughs> If you had to send some films to the Soviet Union, let's say, to represent us, what would you send? What do you think would be us if, if there's something that represents us? Oh, I don't know that I could pick out my names now, but I would think stories that revealed our freedom, stories that revealed how we lived, and I don't mean plush living. The, the fact, for example, of the single home that uh, instead of those concrete rabbit nests that they have built for all of their people, that they could have a house with a yard and so forth and a car in the driveway. I would like to have them see these things that they've never seen. American films are shown all over the world. People judge us in great part by these films, rightly or wrongly. You've seen, uh, I think, all of the films this year it's, that, that are up for awards. Uh, Without uh, pinning you down too much, which were some of your favorites? We loved Eleni. Eleni, uh, Africa. Out of Africa? Uh, out of Africa. Um, I hear you like Witness. The Witness. Yeah. This year, the big box office hits, The Color Purple, which is... Oh, uh, we enjoyed that? Enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. And it shows prejudice between blacks and whites, uh, yeah. great poverty. Um, Rambo, which is violence. Yeah. Uh, did you enjoy that? Yep. <laughs> did you enjoy that? Yeah. Yes, there were parts of it. That <laughs> <laughs> One of the greatest successes of this past year has been Back to the Future. Oh, yes. Why did we skip them? We yes, loved that. Yes. How did you like it when Michael J. Fox goes back to the 1950s and they say, well, who's president in 1985? And they say, <laughs> remember? They yes. say, Ronald Reagan, and they said, Ronald Reagan! <laughs> the, there was a film of yours that, that was supposedly playing in the playing Marquee, the Cattle Queen of Montana. Cattle Queen that of was Montana. it, with that was she it. and uh, Barbara, Barbara Stanwyck, Stanwyck and I. Yeah. yeah, Cattle Queen, that was it. One of your great triumphs, Cattle Queen of Montana. <laughs> <laughs> she was the Cattle Queen. When the Barbara Walters special returns, a visit with the First Lady. since Jacqueline Kennedy has any first lady brought so much elegance to the White House. From her clothes down to the kind of flowers used at political functions, Nancy Reagan sets the style. And then also I wanted to ask you about, this is a new Gerber that we just got in. And I'm not sure whether or not it's going to be too pink for the yellow old room. I'm not sure either. I think, I think what we're going to have to do is take it up and try it. She pays such close attention to menus that she eats entire state dinners twice. No, what's that, that up there? First, privately with the president for review, and again at the official dinner. Do you do first lady jokes? I do one first lady joke because I like her so much. And I, it's a way of letting them know I like her without saying, hey, I love the first lady in the middle of the act. And I say, she's such a lady, she's such a lady. When she washes out her pantyhose, she washes out the whole pantyhose, not just the feet and the crotch like we do. <laughs> and the audience laughs, and I get in the point that I think she's terrific. I think Nancy has been a tremendous help to uh, the president uh, through some trying times that he's had as a trend. After all, uh, a bullet, an assassin's bullet that far from his heart uh, a major cancer surgery and everything through it. I think Nancy was the one that, that kept him kept him up, and and now you'd never you'd never know that the, those things happened. Her unwavering support of her husband, her involvement in drug abuse programs, and her sense of style have captivated the public and calmed many of her critics. Recent polls have shown you to be one of the most popular first ladies we've ever had. When you compare that to those early days of Queen Nancy, <laughs> of Vita of Beverly Hills, what do you think made the difference? I think there was probably fault on both sides. On my side and on the press's side. Uh, I, I have a tendency to... Uh, if somebody hurts me or says something that I know isn't true, I pull back and the wall comes down. Um, the press, on the other hand, didn't really know me. And I think it's a, been a process of getting to know each other, maybe. 
What do you think was your biggest mistake? I don't think I'll tell you. <laughs> but you but know, I surely made them. But you know, yeah. of course, I've made them. And and now, when you hear people say she is the power behind the throne, no. does it make you feel? No, no, it's just not true. What do you think that your influence is? I mean, we all know how close you are to your husband. What influence do you have? He never thinks that that anybody is taking advantage of him or in running him. And um, I don't know whether it's being an, a, a woman or uh, just being more intuitive about those things, but I can usually spot pretty well and, and all the little antenna go up. And then what do you do? And then I tell him. Do you think people fear you? I guess if they, if they do fear me, then they fear me because they think that I might say something mm -hmm. that might be true about them to my husband. Your daughter Patty said in an interview recently, there's a type of woman, and my mother is one, who has given up a lot for her man. The more prominent your husband, the larger his ambitions are, the more you have to give up. Is that true? Do you feel you've had to give up a lot? Well, no, but you see, that, that was my choice. I wanted to do that. I, I had graduated from college, I'd had a career, and I enjoyed it, but I hadn't found the man I wanted to marry. Mm. And when I did find the man I wanted to marry, that was, that was what I wanted to do. And that's brought me great happiness. So you never felt that you gave anything no. up? No. As a matter of fact, I gained a lot from the life that he, that I thought I was marrying an actor. Little did I dream. <laughs> Little did she dream indeed. Among the highlights of this past year for the First Lady was the visit of His Royal Highness Prince Charles and the intriguing Princess of Wales, Princess Diana. So tell us, what is she really like? <laughs> well, she's very pretty, as you know. Um, I think even prettier in person. Some yes, I think so too. Animated. Yes, yeah. she has that wonderful English complexion, yeah. you know, that they all have. And she was very, well, she was very, very easy, very nice, very pleasant. And I think she had a good time. I think, as far as my wife is concerned, the great highlight was um, being able to dance with John Travolta, mm -hmm. which she uh, enjoyed enormously. How would you describe Mrs. Reagan? Uh, I've always been rather a fan of Mrs. Reagan, and she's always been extremely kind to me, I must say. And we've always, I find, got on extremely well and had a great deal to talk about. And, and uh, she's always been interested in the things I'm interested in. And uh, she very kindly listens, which is uh, a particular talent, I think. Prince Charles told us that you were a particular favorite of his. Ah, uh, well, that's nice. He's a particular favorite of mine. <laughs> We first met when uh, my husband was governor, so it's a long time. I feel as if he's family almost. <laughs> We've talked about the good times, and then in so many ways this year was so difficult. When you look back at it in your terms, as I say this, what stands out in your mind? Oh, all. Uh, there just seemed to be so many, so many tragedies that, that happened one right after the other. You just would finish getting over one, and then another one would come along. And I think the, uh, the last one, the Challenger, I think was maybe particularly hard to get over because of, of the visual part of it. I was, I had it on and was watching. Were you alone when you were watching? I was alone. Just, just just me and I couldn't believe it and for you personally this year it's been rough mm -hmm. it hasn't father. been a good year no <laughs> it hasn't been easy there was uh, so much written so much on television so many reports when it was found that the president had cancer mm -hmm. There is the question that we still debate. How much does a president owe it to the public to have the public know the condition of his health 
And what about the private man and his family? Have you resolved that for yourself? Well, I, certainly I think the public is entitled to know if there's something wrong, if he has cancer or, in his case, had a malignancy. Uh, certainly they're, they're entitled to know that. The thing that, the thing that upset me before was uh, doctors who, who knew nothing about the case had no knowledge of the case, were not connected with the case, going on television and talking about it. And uh, it's very difficult, you, you know, to be in the hospital room with your husband and having some doctor come on television and say, well, I'll give him about four days. <laughs> and he doesn't know anything about it. And how did the president feel when he saw this? It just got me. Well, it's upsetting. <laughs> do you think too many details are given up? Sometimes. I mean, yeah. I mean yes, do we sometimes. have to know every little aspect no, of it that's no, really that person? No, I don't think so. No, I, I don't think it's necessary that you stand inside of his colon, you know, every night. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessary. When the president goes through something like that, what does it do to you? The assassination attempt on the president shook you for months. I don't know, perhaps it still has. Do you still have that same terrible fear? Well, it's there in the back of your mind. Did his illness give you that same fear? Has it shaken you, changed that you? Came as, that came as such a, as such a surprise. Uh, we, we stopped. Uh, uh, stopped there on our way to Camp David, so we thought. And um, and when he came out from the uh, from the examination, he was making jokes as he always does. And then when they told me, uh, took me in the other room and and, told, and I was all alone that time. I think that was the thing that bothered me most of all, at, at least with the assassination attempt. To, uh, I had, I had people around me. I had friends around me. Was there a moment when you had to think of what your life might have been like without him? Uh, I think I went through that on the 30th, March 30th, more than, more than this time. Because, because they, they seemed, they seemed so, they seemed so sure that it was just localized mm -hmm. and they could get everything. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing in the hospital is not to cry in front of him mm -hmm. because then he would think that there was something that they weren't telling him or it was more serious than they said or that I said and that would bother him. So you try very hard not to cry in front of him. You had told me the last time we talked what a warrior you were. You stayed up <laughs> I, all night. Yeah. Yes. With everything that's happened, do you worry less or is that still... No, that, it's still it's there. the same thing. Jack Benny said to me once, don't you get tired of people who say to you, now you mustn't worry. Stop yeah. worrying. Yeah. When you're born a worrier, you're a worrier and there's nothing you can do about it. Mm -hmm. If you had to give advice to a future first lady, what would you tell her? Well, be yourself. You were yourself the first year. Look what it got you. I know. Well, you have to be yourself and hope that it works out. Um, thick skin helps. <laughs> Coming up, a view from the Oval Office and the Reagans talk about their children. This is the president's private study, which adjoins the Oval Office, and cameras have never before been permitted to film here. This is where the president first saw on television the explosion of the Challenger. It is where he comes when he wants to work alone, or to spend some private time, or to lunch alone, usually just a bowl of soup. He is the president who's been dubbed the great communicator, 
although the reality is that he communicates mostly in prepared speeches and press conferences. But many feel that it is his skill in communicating with people, his sense of humor, and his ability to soothe a grieving nation during times of crises that have made him one of the most popular presidents in history. Mr. President, you are enormously popular. Okay. This may seem like a funny question, but what do you think makes you so popular with the American people? Well, Barbara, that's a, that's a hard one to answer because if I start out and answer the question, I'm sounding like I agree with you that I'm terribly popular. I, I, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's because we are doing what down inside most Americans always wanted, and that is uh, trying to get government back to the people and stop the federal government from uh, imposing too much on their lives. That's the nice question. Now comes the unnice question. First I warm you up, then I ask you the next one, okay? Mm -hmm. All right. You have also been called the Teflon president. Mm -hmm. You've heard that. Yes. Because they say nothing sticks to you, no criticism sticks to you, that you get away with everything. How do you answer that criticism? <laughs> well, maybe it has something to do with an image that's been created that, uh, frankly, I find a little frustrating. And that is that... Um, I don't really think for myself uh, that staff tells me what to do. Mm. And uh, then there's the other one that I'm always making gaffes. I'm saying things that aren't so. I'll always be sorry that I didn't overrule some people on one of those some a few years ago, a press conference. And the day after the press conference, the press was out with six horrendous mistakes, gaffes that I had made. But I sat down and I documented the six things that I had said. And only one of them could be called, you know, technically wrong. So I wrote a statement. The effect that knowing the press's desire for accuracy in all things, I thought they would like to know that uh, I was right and they were wrong in these matters. And everybody talked me out of it and said it would sound defensive. Well, about that time, I was feeling like I wanted to be defensive. I still kept the article, mm -hmm. but uh, I heard the statement, but I never made it. Do you think it still happens? I mean, do you, do you think that either you do not make gaffes or that the press likes to just keep saying you do? I just think that there has been a kind of an image, and they're not going to give up on that. Well, you know, I, I have to tell you that I almost would have felt funny asking you about it because it does seem so rude, but since you, you yourself brought it up, I mean, there is that feeling of he's very nice, but not very bright. Or we can't leave him alone in the room with, with the Mr. Gorbachev because if he's without his aides, he just can't make it. Um, <laughs> yes, I was in the room with Mr. Gorbachev alone for an hour and a half. We had left here with the belief that if we could only, if the only thing we could get out of the summit was an agreement to have future summits have meetings and they're very tough to deal with on that they don't come volunteering to have summits that it would be a successful meeting but at the end of the hour and a half as we walked back up to the building where his team and mine were gathered uh, he said something about that he would like me to see something in Russia and I turned to him and said yes but I said you've never been to the United States why don't we have the next meeting in 1986 in the United States and I'm inviting you and he said I accept and he then said but then in 87 you should come to the Soviet Union well I had the pleasure of going to the room with my team and telling them that it was all settled that there was going to be a meeting in 86 and 87 the first one in Washington and the second one in Moscow they couldn't believe it something they thought would take days to accomplish mm -hmm. you of course are being called all the time the great communicator do you think that any of that is the acting experience? I mean, are you able to express emotion in, in, a, in a, a better way, perhaps, or a different way than other political people are because you, it's just instinctive? I don't know whether that has anything to do with it. I have often thought, though, that having been in show business wasn't a bad preparation mm -hmm. for a job like this. I thought it about uh, when, I was, when I was governor. Uh, no kidding, because thing. people say just the opposite, you know. Uh, I know. Actually, why I is know. it good preparation? Well, for one thing, you, you don't get 
flustered as you might. And you don't say, hey, wait a minute, you know, this isn't the way to do it. You, you find yourself uh, developing a way to, uh, to do it. I've often wondered what some people in positions of this kind who've never had that, I've sometimes wondered uh, how, do they, how do they manage without having had that experience. Yes. Is it true that once you make up your mind and you really decide something, that you rarely, if ever, change it? If somebody can present a good reason why it should be changed, as a matter of fact, I have undergone one change since I've been here. I'll tell you about it. Um, I came here in perfect agreement with the 22nd Amendment, the new amendment that says a president can only serve two terms. Now, let me hasten to say I've changed, but not because of me. I have no illusions about me and my time in life and so forth. It would have to be changed for whoever would follow on down the road. You could never do this for yourself exactly. any more than you could ask for a pay raise for yourself. But um, in thinking about it more and more, I have come to the conclusion that the 22nd Amendment was a mistake. Shouldn't the people have the right to vote for someone as many times as they wanted to vote for them. They send senators up there for 30 and 40 years, congressmen the same. Why should they claim that there's one office that must be cut off? If you were younger, would you like to run for a third term? I don't honestly know. But you might. But uh, as I say, I'm just thinking of, isn't this an invasion of the democratic right of the people? Do you think there should be any age limit uh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I think... 75, 76 is okay, right? <laughs> Do you think the retirement age that most companies have of 65 should be abolished? I'm a little resentful of uh, mandatory retirement ages because uh, the biological age does not determine automatically who is or is not uh, due for retirement. I wish that maybe we'd go back to the other way of, of uh, basing it on the individual. I want to look back over the last year and a half since your re-election because it has been so tumultuous when you stop to think of it. Bitburg, the TWA hostages, uh, the Achille Laura, uh, the Challenger, your own personal health and so on. And you left out 267 soldiers. Soldiers, the Marines, yeah. yeah. Can you share with us, in all of this, your most agonizing decision? Oh. I think the worst decisions have to be those in which you are going to ask someone to do something that can threaten their lives. Uh, my first and only real experience with that uh, had to do with the Grenada. Even though we knew that our power was so great and all, yet you found that you or I was going to say the thing that was going to put men under fire. What is your greatest fear? A few years ago, you said uh, that the Soviet Union was the evil empire, that it was our greatest threat to peace. Do you still think it is, or is it something else? Well... <laughs> I have tactfully uh, tried to uh, quiet down now because we are trying to talk and arrive at some agreements. I do not regret at all saying those things because I came here believing that it was necessary after the efforts that this country has made back through the years to try and establish a detente with the Soviet Union, that too much of it was done on a kind of a mirror image that we thought, gee, we're nice people. And if we can only, if they can only see that, yeah. and uh, then they'll be nice when they see that we don't mean them any harm. And I thought it was necessary to establish reality, to let them see that no, we definitely saw what they were doing as evil, shooting down of a plane with 269 passengers in it, killing one of our officers in uniform uh, for no reason at all. I wanted them to know that I, I saw them realistically. Still do? Yes. Still think they're the greatest threat to peace? Yes, until by deed, not alone word, they prove that they are willing to get along in the world with 
countries that have other systems and other forms of government. When we have seen in just the last month the downfall of Duvalier in Haiti, President Marcos, is this a trend? What I think we're seeing is a great swing to democracy. You see democracy on the rise, not communism on the rise? Yes. As a matter of fact, there are some things like Afghanistan still going on. But the communists in the last few years before we came here had added Yemen, South Yemen, Ethiopia, Angola. Uh, that's only a few of them down the line. In these last five years, there has not been one inch of territory, additional territory taken over in the world by the communists. Knowing what you know now, what advice would you give to future presidents? Well, believe in the people. That's the great secret of this country. It comes down to, I'd say, keep government out of their way and let the people do what the people can do so well. Next, the Reagans talk about their marriage and their children. As a couple, the Reagans have always presented a picture of support, commitment, and affection. They have a sort of a communication that is that is uh, stronger than I've seen in almost anybody, and this, they, they, they help each other. But neither their strong communication nor their role as first family has spared them the problems of parenting. Their daughter, Patty, has written a controversial book which is being publicized as an autobiographical novel about a president and his family. And their son, Ron, made headlines recently when he hosted Saturday Night Live and did a takeoff of the movie Risky Business. It's tough to bring up kids. What kind of a father do you think you were? Well, if you ask Nancy, she'd say I was a soft touch. <laughs> uh, but then, <laughs> uh, maybe I, I, I thought I was a, a good father. And due to the business that we were in, in show business, I probably had much more time with our children than the average nine to five father who has to leave and go out there because of those periods between pictures and so forth and mm -hmm. uh, and it um, and maybe there were times when uh, I should have been sterner than I was what kind of a mother do you think you were Mrs. Reagan I tried to be a good mother um, I don't think anybody's perfect but then you know there's no perfect parent, there's no perfect child. She was a good mother. You know, this is something that I know has to be painful, but it's going to be coming up more and more. And so I will take the liberty of asking. Your daughter, Patty, has written a book which is called, frankly, uh, an autobiographical. It's called an autobiographical novel. And in it, she talks about a governor of California who becomes president, who's interested in his political career to the exclusion of his children. She writes about a mother who was a, a clothes horse and so protective of the father that she won't let the kids um, give their own feelings. Uh, the father has a, a poem from the daughter put on his desk and never even looks at it. How does it make you feel? Well, I've read it. And I'd heard all those things that are supposed to be autobiographical and in the framework of a governor of California becoming a president and so forth, that, uh, that much was true. But um, I have to tell you, my only answer is, uh, when I read it, it was interesting fiction. And I will cite the line that appears at the end of every movie, because it fits the situation. Any resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. I didn't recognize anyone in that, and certainly the happenings never happened. And when you asked about, well, for example, a poem, uh, right down now, down in my dressing room, as a framed picture that's always been with me and came to Washington with me. And as a piece of lined tablet paper with a pencil printed note on it from uh, our daughter. Also, your son Ron writes and is a, is a fine actor and dancer and uh, we saw him 
uh, a few weeks back on Saturday Night Live. Um, he was very poised, he was very charming. He did a dance in his uh, underpants. And you were quoted as saying, that, hey, you thought he was pretty talented. Other people I did. said, Oh, the poor president, poor Mrs. Reagan. This was so, this was so disrespectful. They must have been so upset. How do you answer them? I thought he was very good. I thought he was. I thought he showed a a, a presence and a, a warmth and a humor and a timing in 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 something that he'd never done before. So you were, neither one of you were offended when you saw it. No, no, and we were kind of surprised because we had never seen him do anything. We've. You know, his principal occupation has been writing, and we have believed that he has developed quite a personal style in his writing that we, uh, uh, we were gratified and, and enjoy. And then to see him do this and, uh, and do it again with such assurance. You such enjoyed presence. it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It was good. Do you think that parents and children can ever really totally understand each other? Oh, I think as they get older. Yeah. Oh, you think so? Well, and maybe after you get to be parents, then you do. You don't feel anger at them, though, when they come out and do things, do you? Or say things that might hurt? Well, you get a little annoyed sometimes. But... Do you get hurt? Oh, of course you get hurt. But you don't get angry? Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> we are coming to the point now we're talking about the present and um, soon year or so you're going to be thinking about the future when you think of the retirement what do you see yourself doing what do you mean when i'm not going to the ranch when you're not going to the ranch <laughs> when you're no longer in the white house well there were several years between being governor and this job here when uh, i had three pretty busy occupations one of them was a, a radio commentary you're not going to do that again well i don't know I may and he's going to write a book he's going to write a book ah <laughs> you keep telling me do you want to write a book uh, i uh well, yes I, I guess i do <laughs> I, you know, I, I have a once, feeling you're going to write a book i have it I, having done it once i know how much work it is would you ever make another film would there ever be a part that they could offer you that you would do seems hard for me to believe that that I could mm. and I think I'd have a feeling that maybe it would look like I was exploiting the office that I had held you have just celebrated uh, in March 34 years of marriage doesn't seem possible how do you keep the romance in a marriage I, <laughs> I don't know we we'll get along <laughs> <laughs> oh I think I think it used to be that the, that uh, one one of you thought that it had to be everything had to be your way mm -hmm. or fifty fifty, and it isn't always fifty fifty. What is it? Sometimes it's ninety ten, and you have to be willing to give the ninety, or he has to be willing to give the ninety, and it's but it's something you want to do. Mm -hmm. Which is it more often? Fifty fifty, ninety ten, or which one? I don't think we count anymore. I don't think so either. You just, you know, you do. Clark Gable had a line once that I thought was very eloquent. That there's nothing more wonderful for a man than to approach his own doorstep knowing that someone on the other side of the door is listening for the sound of his footsteps. Mm -hmm. And I've always had the feeling that for 34 years that somebody is listening. Walters Special, brought to you by Stouffer's Lean Cuisine and Stouffer's Entree. Quality, variety, and great taste. Foods for the way people eat today, from Stouffer's. All right, you carry here. Look, 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 look at everybody. Yeah, look, look at all those people. Look, these, look, these, look at them with your big brown eyes. You know that that's cute. Is he White House broken? Yes. Well, he is quite a scene stealer. Didn't anyone ever tell you not to do scenes with dogs? Or children. Or children. <laughs> so maybe since he is stealing all the scenes right now, this is a good time for us to thank you both for being with us on 
on this special evening for motion pictures and for the Academy Awards. Thank you. If there is a film made of your lives, who should play Rex? Rex. Rex. Rex, Rex who do you want to play you? Huh? <laughs> He'll let you know. <laughs>